Okay, so <laughs> welcome back everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. We've got the the, uh, the denouement. Uh, that's my Del Boy bit, attempting French. The denouement of the evening with the panel discussion. And uh, on our panel, oh, I have what, the esteemed representation of the BTRM faculty. From the far end, Dean Carter. Next to him, Mal Guzzato, who you just saw presented on CSRBB. Michael Eichhorn, Professor Dr. Michael Eichhorn. Claire, who you saw earlier presenting on RMB, and Chris Westcott. All BTRM faculty, and when it comes to all matters asset liability management, these chaps will forget more than all the rest of us will ever know. Right, so, rest assured, whatever questions you've got, they should be able to address them. Now, I don't know if you've seen the film The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Have you seen that film? And Tuco, the character played... <laughs> play, you've not seen that film? The character played by Eli Wallach, right? Tuco, he's got a great line. He goes, there's two kinds of people in the world, my friend. And I've adapted that for this. In today's hybrid meeting world, there's two kinds of people in the world, my friend. Those in the room and those online. And those in the room are going to get priority for the questions. And may I just say to the panel, you know, anyone who feels like, yep, I want to drop in on that, jump in and answer questions. I'm not going to direct them. Unless none of you volunteer, and I will be picking you. All right, none of you volunteer, I'm going to be picking you. So, uh, do we have a question to start with uh, in the room? Yes, sir. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just waiting for the mic. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, um, just speak, yes, um, so the new incoming or, or the new guidance for the new NII calculations of the EBA, um, is, is, is the expectation that people are expected to hedge their positions on the back of the results from the, the, the new calculations or is it uh, good to know? I would say EVE has always been the focus of the EBA, um, but in these new regulations, because NII is taking a bit more of a spotlight, but it's not that you have to manage your NII over your EVE, you have to have a balance between the two. So I think that's the most important thing is getting that balance right. But, but I, I, I guess the question is, um, NII is calculated or, or, or it's calculated for a projected balance sheet. So the question is, is whether you're expected to hedge positions in order to, min to in, in order to maintain your NII on a projected theoretical balance sheet that may or may not exist. So you're actually putting on risk positions potentially that will, you know, if, if the balance sheet doesn't come in as you expect, you'll, you, you've opened up a risk position. Um, the balance sheet will never come in as you expect. I, I think this thing about projections it is in one sense, we, we all talk about this, oh, it doesn't add up or, or that may never happen. F for me, the, the point is, it, it, is EVE is really about capital a capital hit. And actually, the regulator is really interested in that because if your EVE's really offside and, and you have to be handed over to somebody else, then nobody's going to want you if, there's, if, you're, if you've got a big offside position. Whereas net interest income is your P&L for the next year. So I wouldn't say it's a, a binary hedge or not hedge. I'd say you look at it and you see what impact it has on your projections, on, on your plans. And if it's big enough to materially impact on your outcome, your hoped outcome, then you need to do something about it. And it might be some hedging. It might be changing your product mix going forward. It might be altering your business plans. It's not just about hedging. It's about what might happen and how that will change. And so it's, it's a dynamic process integrated with other factors as opposed to just we hedge or we don't hedge. That, that's right. how our professor says it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. no, uh, you're happy? Right. Just, just, one just one very minor point. I think the way you suggested the question at the beginning sounded to me as if the whole regulatory side was could be separate from what you're actually doing. and. To me, the biggest principle overall is they have to be the same thing. You can't have, oh, we do this to the regulator, but we manage our business in this other way. Um, so I don't know how that relates to the actual question, but, but somehow they have to be brought into line. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 May I just also say, yeah. chaps, remember, you've got to have the mic right up to your mouth, OK? We're just pointing at your mouth. Think it's right there. See, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, my, thank you. Got it. OK, Michael, you want to have to that? Thank you. Just, just building on this, and I agree with Chris, and that's also how I understood the question. For me, it's more, it's an evolution. It's not that this new piece of regulation is a game changer. It, it should be aligned, and it's an evolution. I think there's uh, a lot of details, um, but it shouldn't be a fundamental shift for any, any existing bank. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Sir, yes, Ed, if we can get oh, on. Thank you. Hello. So, so this is on CSRBB. So, uh, so I think the general view in the banks is that uh, CSRBB, the, um, the regulatory's expectations are a bit impractical. Um, so they're kind of more theoretical and um, it's not possible to kind of do the gradient approach, what they're doing or what they're asking. Um, so is it a view that they always point to fair value assets being kind of the minimum scope, but uh, you might be okay with that? Um, so is that the view from the regulator that uh, there's a consensus that uh, there's going to be a, a fair value assets, which is going to be the minimum scope first, and then we go on to analyzing the whole balance sheet, whether we have the credit spread uh, relevant to the market uh, or not for other assets and other liabilities and on off and on balance sheet as well. So uh, if you if you read the regulation, it it doesn't it doesn't actually say that, but at the same time, there is a lot of focus on. Proportion, sorry, proportionality. Um, so obviously there has been this leeway in a sense of is this the right approach for our uh, institution, for our organization? And they, so I recommend reading, reading those chapters when referring to, you know, including or excluding any items and uh, thinking about how does it fit within your business model or the size. And he does touch on a little bit on um, some some of the banks that I work with, um, you know, financial institutions I work with, saying we don't have CSRBB. What do we do about it? Um, which my recommendation is, you know, at least present your thought process. Think about, uh, you know, this is where we think majority of risk is sitting. This is relevant to our size this is what we we don't think there is much more beyond that based on xyz so as long as you go through this exercise that you review every now and then i don't know if you add new product type or uh, mar there is a, a market um change um then i think this is this is the right approach for for, the, for those organizations especially of the smaller size or you know less le uh, yeah within the the market. Thank you. Did, did anyone did anyone want to add anything on that? I'm happy. Okay. Uh, anything else in the room? No. Okay. Let's go to the screen then. So here's a couple of factual ones which you can just uh, we can just uh, cover off straight away. To what extent do the EBA guidelines apply to UK banks? Are similar guidelines expected to be published by UK regulators? And then following on from that, in which way specifically are the EBA regulations different from those published by the Basel Committee? Who wants to take, well, the first one is reasonably straightforward. To what extent does EBA apply to the UK? Um, so if you're a UK bank and you're operating in Europe, then you're going to fall under the EBA regulation. Um, but if you're just operating in the UK, then you don't have to follow the EBA regulation, but you might be falling under the strong and simple framework. So this is kind of like the opposite of EBA regulation and that they're being a lot more relaxed about the regulation for banks that are just within the UK. Um, so it depends where you're doing business. If your business is just in the UK, then you might fall under the strong and simple framework, in which case your regulatory requirements are going to be a lot less um, but if you're in the UK but you're also in many other countries worldwide then you're going to have to follow the EBA rules um, and the Basel rules is the global rules um, so you have to follow the Basel rules and then other jurisdictions can add on additional requirements so the EBA can add additional requirements onto the BIS but they can't take anything away. Thank you. I'm going to almost agree with Claire um, uh, I, I think Basel is, is a framework uh, that the committee would like everybody to follow. 
Uh, if you look at the, the EBA, and the only reason I know this is because I was looking on the way down, um, doing a bit of swatting, but uh, it, it says in there we follow most of the Basel recommendations. Um, so I think it's for individual, what matters legally at jurisdictional level is what your local regulator is imposing. Basel's there as a framework which you should follow most of because every year Basel will produce a report to assess how well you follow their framework. And if you don't follow it very well, they will tell you and hold you up as a bad citizen kind of thing. So you should follow most of it, but you don't have to follow all of it. And what matters for the banks in your jurisdiction is what your local regulator says. Actually, what Basel says is not your direct concern. I would just like to add in an extra point about the global regulation. <laughs> no, I, I agree, but um, I know with the strong and simple framework that lo logic is they don't have to follow the BIS because they're not doing international payments. So if you do too many international payments and you do business with other countries, then they say that you have to follow the global regulation. But the whole ideology behind having a strong, strong and simple framework, which is specific for small UK banks, is that they're not doing any international business. So that means that they can have their own rules because everything's going on within the UK. Great, thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to ask the panel, or at least one or more from the panel, to, 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 to interpret some rationale because I've got a question on the screen that says, what is the rationale behind having a supervisor at liar test, that's the SOT, um, for NII, what are the benefits from this? And then a follow-up question that says, on the SOT for NII, what is the feeling how strict regulators will enforce the 5% limit? Seems like a very harsh limit, and many banks are currently exceeding it. So, uh, does someone want to tackle first what's the regulator's rationale behind the SOT for NII delta? And then, do we think 5% is a little bit harsh? Um, who wants to take that first? I, I can start. So from our perspective, over the years, um, if I reflect on banks that have failed or where treasurers have lost their jobs, I, I think... <laughs> but one, one common pattern is that I, I always illustrated this with wearing three ties, um, blue tie, EVE, red tie, NRI, grey tie, the accounting view. What all these cases have in common that the treasurer was not wearing all three ties and got surprised when one of the risks illustrated by one of the ties materialized and it, it completely took them by surprise. Um, and therefore I think it is paramount um, to wear all three ties at all times and to understand the differences that does not mean and as, as a framework also says you should not lead your risk management with an accounting view but it is important i think from from the cases that i've seen and i know there have been 12 wars um to have a look at all three ties and then as part of this also to look at the nri make sure that uh, you don't take an extreme nri position and i think in in that sense the threshold it's debatable if it should be 5% or 2.5%, but I think I, I can see the rationale to say we want to make sure that we have a more balanced view. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Carter? Um, I, I'm going to, I like the red, blue and grey ties. Uh, I think one of the issues with that is that sometimes the grey tie gets more... <laughs> no, the grey tie, the accounting tie, gets more of a voice at the top table than the red or blue ties, whichever were the other two. That's exactly why I say you cannot ignore it. And, then, yeah. and, and that's, I think, especially in the UK, that's a big issue. The reason I think NII is really important and why we need to treat it harshly is for two reasons. The first one is we have no idea what's going to happen. It's February 2020, nobody had any idea the bank base rate was going to go from 0.75 to 0.25 to 0.1. We had relatively little idea it was going to go from 0 0.1 to 525 just recently. So if you don't do some harsh tests, everything looks rosy until the harsh test comes along and then you haven't got any NII. Well, you might have some, but it might be a negative NII. So always test the, the extremes and an outlier is 
Well, it does what it says in the tin. It's an outlier one. Thank you. Thank you, chaps. Still on the screen. Uh, do you think CSRBB is a misleading term? It should represent market liquidity risk. It is meant to represent the term premium, isn't it? As well as, as well, and people tend to forget about it. Oh, well, not the ones attending here, right? <laughs> um, oh, and related to that, um, I'll tell you straight to you, Margaret Zaza. CSRBB should be calculated from an NRR perspective as well, and almost every position have a spread risk which could be quantified. Um, so let's just, and there's a third one on CSRBB, but um, it, 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 the term encompasses the term of the premium, but they, they just have credit in the name. I mean, should we just ignore that? Uh so, so I do actually agree with this comment. I think I did cover that in my presentation that the moment I said credit spread risk, everyone is like, oh, credit risk. Well, that's not the case. I think that the name is obviously misleading. That's why I think this chart that I included, which isn't mine, it is actually from the actual regulation, um, clearly states what elements there, there are um uh, within that framework so um i do agree on the misleading name uh, <laughs> however obviously this is now common understanding this is the definition we use um it's good to refer back to what's actually under that umbrella yeah okay thank you and uh now should it be calculated from an earnings sensitivity and on our perspective here is on the screen as well because uh, when we think of CSRBB, we think of a fair value adjustment because the credit spread is widened, okay? So it's an EVE impact, isn't it? Um, or CSO1, if you like, credit spread O1, if you use for, for Bloomberg users. <laughs> should, we, should we also, um, is there, I mean, personally, I don't see this, but I'd love to hear, hear you guys' opinion on it. Should we also do a kind of CSRBB from an earning sensitivity? Would the earnings be impacted? if the credit spread widened. I don't see this, but love to hear your opinion. Um, so this is actually, uh, so both EV and uh, NII are, are mentioned in the regulation as, as uh, obviously considerations. So they're trying to match whatever um, approach is there for IRBB with the CSRBB. Um, is it always going to be the, the easiest assumption? You know, I'm not a huge fan of CSO1. Uh, that's definitely that. I think I had a brief conversation here uh, in the room with with my colleagues, actually, that uh, I've never seen a, a curve move in a parallel way. So all sensitivity t t testing, especially by, by one basis point, is a purely theoretical Sorry, exercise. Let's <laughs> tell you why. You try to tell me the EVE standardised test doesn't assume a parallel shift. We know none of it moves in a parallel fashion. I know that credit spread doesn't move in a parallel fashion. And I know if I take CSO1 and I multiply it by 200 to give me my shock, I know it's not 200 times CSO1. We know all this. Yeah. But nonetheless, that, I mean, the whole concept behind EVE is all about parallel shifts. I know they have the pivotal and this and the other. Yeah. By the way, did we not love Claire's five slides on non-parallel shifts? I've already told them I'm going to nick them, right? I'm going to nick them. No, I'll keep the name on it, don't worry. I'll keep the name on But we, we all make these simplifying assumptions. I mean, the regulator does as well, right? So I, I obviously, as a risk professional, I know why it has to be simplified because it's already uh, too difficult for a number of stakeholders when you try to explain it back, um, in a sense. Uh, and obviously, it's all a simplified version of the world, but we cannot lose the side of um, that our modeling, forecasting uh, is not a real representation of the world sometimes. And there are, it is a multi factor um, impact impact on whatever you you having so obviously right now we're covering irbb csrbb etc we focus on those uh, the treasury core treasury risk factors but there's the whole array of non-financial risk that could also um, uh, impact your institution but i'm not gonna go into there <laughs> Thank you. that's for another presentation did anyone have any opinion on the just the view i mean it is what it is the rule is the rule but the, the eba's earnings limit without there being a capital impact is 5%. The earnings delta is 5% of capital. Do we think that's too strict? It's not strict enough. I mean, there was a comment from our correspondent here that said there are a number of banks in Europe that are already exceeding that. What do we think of the 5%? I mean, at the end of the day, it's the rules. That's what we follow. But what do we think of that? 
Um, I just wonder whether it's not about, we keep talking about the regulator and mm. and what us complying with the regulator and is the regulator strict or is the regulator whatever the opposite of strict is. I don't dare get into that. Um, but surely it's about your own risk appetite and it's about whether it's EVE or NII or, or whatever it is, your credit risk, your credit risk spreads, your how much capital you're going to eat over something. It's your appetite that should be important and it's your appetite that should really suit your business model, your strategy, your pockets. Have you got deep capital pockets or not, etc. So. I mean, I could almost argue that, you know, in, in one sense, a 5% limit is arbitrary because some people might have very deep pockets and therefore they can run a much bigger risk. And others have got very shallow pockets. Maybe, you know, they're a new bank that's just started and they're running on really tight margins and therefore they shouldn't have anywhere near 5%. And really, it's about you explaining to the regulator where you are how you're doing, what your plans are, and how you think you've mitigated or at least controlled these. I guess the A minus, 100%, and couldn't, couldn't agree more, spot on. Although we know in the real world, there will be some banks that will only just, whether they admit it or not, they'll just do what they're obliged to do. They won't have that enlightened approach that you've just described. Which we know is it's not just a logical approach, not an enlightened. Approach. Well, it's logical and enlightened, but there's lots of sure. unenlightened and illogical in the world. But I completely agree with that, Michael. You're going to yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And then the picture that I've got in mind is um, showing Donald Trump and and, and where where he's exempt smaller U.S. banks from EBE, and and, and, and let as as um, Claire said it led to cases like Silicon Valley Bank. If Silicon Valley Bank were regulated under a regulator that has an EBE requirement, they potentially wouldn't have failed. So I, I think we need to elevate ourselves uh, above regulation, as, as, as you rightly say, and then say, what makes sense? And that should be, I think, that should be the golden exam question. Then, of course, you have to comply with regulations, but it, what makes sense? And what is your risk appetite? What is your business model? I, I think it, it's a fallacy always to ask what, what do regulators expect and then we follow it slavishly and, and, and don't really think it through. And so the regulator says we should drive at no faster than 70 miles an hour, but when it's sheet ice, you don't, well, you can do 70 miles an hour and you think, oh, this is really good, I'm making great progress until you try and brake and then you're in the ditch. So it's all about, it's about you, not the regulator. For me, it was not a coincidence that three US banks failed and they failed for very similar reasons. And, and I think the moment this regulation was signed that, that they were exempt, I, I think some dropped the pen. And they shouldn't have done it if they had asked, if they had elevated themselves um, above regulations. Look, 100%, I don't, couldn't agree more. Okay, that everyone should be following. I'm just, it's just, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. well, I don't know about the young kids still in their 20s here, but look, once you get to our age, you know, it's a little bit naive, right? We, I'm 100% with you, Mark, and I, by the way, I don't think SPP could have happened in the EBA or the UK regulation because they've had to report their explosion. I think yeah. players already highlighted that. Yeah. The simple fact is, there are around the world institutions that will only do the minimum. That's just real life, which is why the regulator's job is so hard. But I completely agree that that's the approach we should be doing. So it's not 5% is harsh or not harsh. Let's put in what's in line with our appetite and how deep our pockets are. Agreed. You're trying to get one last word in there, Joyce? Oh, you have the last word. Okay. I know I'm very, very old. In fact, I'm over twice the age of the, the two youngsters here. I, I, this is something that really bugs me all the way along, which is just because the regulator says you should or shouldn't do something, just ignoring it. How can you not do EVE? How can you not do NII? In the bar three, just <laughs> in bar three, it says if you're simple, if you're small stroke non-complex, you, you, you do EVE, you don't have to do basis risk. How can you not do basis risk? You forget, you forget Mr. Carter. First of all, we're in violent agreement here, everybody. There's, there's six people here on the floor here. And what was the regulation that was saying you don't have to do this? There's six people here. The six people here are BTR and faculty. They're not the ALCO members of a 200 billion balance sheet bank. Right? So I'm with you 100%. And I think he wanted the last word. Sorry, forgive me. You can have the last word, Mr. <laughs> okay, back to the screen. Back to the screen. 
Oops, probably my phone. Okay, it's yes. working. Yes, okay. Are you switching off. With yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What look? I'd hate to be sure if I disagreed with you. I'm agreeing with you. Right. Look, let's have a look here. There's um. What about this one? Just completely different subject here. What strategies are available to banks that might be long fixed rate assets, mainly HTM, held to maturity accounting, having weathered the storm of the rate hiking cycle, 10 basis points to 525 or minus 50 to 400, for those who are in a more Alice in Wonderland environment, um, have weathered the storm, storm rate hiking cycle, but remain exposed from an EVE perspective, i.e. they're possibly over the SOT limit of 15%. Um, not sure over, this is quoting the, the correspondent, I'm not sure overlaying hedging at this time might be appropriate given that we could be entering a rate reduction cycle in the near future. Who wants to, to take that? I'll be okay. really quick. Ladies first, sir. Oh, right, go on, yes. Read the balance, the, read the gap return across as well as down. Excellent, thank you. Right, yes. Could, again, we're in violent agreement, Mr. Carter. Where? My point would be that the yield curve is more or less in equilibrium. So it's more or less 50-50 that is going to go up or down. So by saying we've increased rates by this much and we're on a downward trajectory, so let's make decisions based on that, I would say you shouldn't really be doing that. You should be basing your decisions on it's 50-50 of whether it's going to go up or down. Mr. Westcott. And I'd just add two words, risk, appetite. So whether you pursue that or not, must depend on your risk appetite as an organization great thank you michael yeah i would i would break the question down in three what what can you do on the asset side change the product mix what can you do on the liability side change the product mix and then then obviously derivatives as off balance as in, in terms of strategies but i yeah i think that just complements what was said before so i'm i'm with you michael the only thing is that takes time that takes that takes time if you do it <laughs> on balance sheet in particular, right? Um, I, something I want to just pull out of that. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Claire's point, ultimately, if we're doing asset liability management, the view is important, but really we should be immunizing the balance sheet, whatever happens to rate. So it's not a view. This is an ALM process for the whole balance sheet. It's not taking a view. It's not a trading book. So with that view, it informs our actions absolutely what well, you know one doesn't live mm. in any kind of doesn't operate in a vacuum here uh, but I, I think sorry Morat. I, I think you're spot on I think that's a goal in question do you chase a curve or is your purpose to get stable risk oh, through the cycle? thank you my friend that's exactly it this is that's exactly it that's and that I think is what in any in an environment many around the world I observe this observe this the voice at the table the ALM desk or the treasurer at the table um, isn't heard as loud as it should be, say the ALCO table. And in fact, sometimes, not so much in the UK, but in around the world, treasury functions have an explicit PL target. So they themselves might be chasing that view and structuring the balance sheet. If they get the view wrong, they've got a PL hit, which is not what balance sheet management ALM is about. Okay, thank you, sir. Right. Um, anything in the room, meanwhile? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dennison, just wait for the mic, please. Thank you so much. I have a question. In the sense of IRRBB, I think currently we are taking all the positions in the banking book into consideration, and that includes both the organic like loans and deposits, as well as derivatives using for hopefully hedging the risk or mitigating the risk. I just want to check the panel. In your view, let's say we have two bands. One is inherently offsetting assets liabilities with no material risk. So they are like naturally hedged. And another bank, which naturally doesn't have a good match, but rely on derivatives a lot to achieve a good risk mitigation. Currently, I believe on the IRBB, they will be showing the same NI and the same EV exposure. But in your view, should there be any difference between the two? And can somebody summarize the question for the, the online people? Oh, OK. Can you just summarise the question? Should please summarise the question, the team. Um, so, if one bank's got a matched balance sheet and has an outcome on EVE of whatever, 10, and one has a very unmatched balance sheet and has a lot of hedging and EVE comes out at 10, are they the same thing? Well, I'd say two things on that. First thing is, yes, maybe from an EVE perspective, very generally, but from a basis risk perspective, which obviously 
small and, and complex don't need to manage, um, would, would have a big basis risk because now you've got a lot of Sonia on your asset side versus maybe variable or whatever on your liability side. So what you've done is you've, you've switched a repricing risk when you're heavily hedged into a basis risk. So I would say that a match balance sheet would be more stable because it's just matched. Whereas a heavily hedged, not, not the easiest thing to say, a heavily hedged balance sheet has going to have a lot of basis risk because it's carrying a lot of, of uh, Sonia receive rather than the fixed receive uh, once it's hedged. And if you just go back, I won't hog this, if you just go back to 2020-ish, 20, 20 um, five-year Sonia was like 0.5 and now it's 5%. So you might have been paying 0.5 then, and now you're receiving 5.25, Sonia, something like that. So that's a really massive in your favor, but that's not what the hedging's meant to do. The hedging's just meant to dial everything out. I'd just say I completely uh, agree with that. I think banks should start from the proposition they're trying to match naturally. Uh, and go to derivatives if they can't. Um, if we go back to the financial crisis a very long time ago, half the panel was barely born when the financial crisis <laughs> happened. At least one of the panel. <laughs> but I, I seem to remember there was an issue with LIBOR-funded uh, mortgage lenders. Um, yes. And again, because they weren't matched effectively, they got into trouble. So I'd try, if, if I had a balance sheet that was totally unmatched, I'd be trying to do something to improve my natural matching. Uh, sorry, do you mind, sir? It, hold on one second. So I guess my question was more in the case like the hedging is achieving the same effect. So I'm pretty sure what you said, if there's a lot of basis risk there, you're still exposed. But what if the hedging is actually bringing you to the same position as a naturally mm. matched position? It's going to give you sorry, sorry, Dean. You need a mic. You need you need a mic. Otherwise, I'm going to hear you online. <laughs> do, do you want to just repeat that for the online? Sorry, it, it might be an Eve thing, and this is the the point about just reading the gap and going. That's the answer. That's just part of the answer. The 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 the, the exposure versus the limit is just one part of it. You, you'd still, if you look at a gap return, you can still see all the basis risk on there because you'll see loads and loads of receive um, naught to three month. So it's not matched, it's heavily hedged and therefore you've got a lot of basis risk. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, and then maybe I go above your question, maybe not, but I, I really feel strongly about it and maybe I need to get that all to feel that strongly about it. But what I think is actually, it's not only about interest rate risk. If I've learned one, one thing the hard way, we need to look beyond, we cannot look at interest rate risk in isolation. You, you, I think the recent case I've highlighted that there was an interlinkage between interest rate risk and liquidity risk. 100%. If you look at banks that could fail for capital reasons, it's often a combination of a steep interest rate curve and then uh, large credit defaults in an economic crisis. Um, so, I, I think the two banks that you quote, even even if hypothetically, as we said, it's not the case, even if they had exactly the same uh, interest rate risk, the other risk would be different and and, and the, the contagion dynamics would be different, the, the feedback loops. I, I think we need to look at it in the true sense of asset liability management with capital liquidity and interest rate risk uh, on, a, on a joint basis. We need to consider this feedback loops, this interlinkages. And to be honest, I think I feel so strongly about that I go against the grain in a lot of senior managers and, and, and they think I'm on an academic hunt. But I think it is if, if you don't do that, if you don't look at these interlinkages, if you don't look at balance sheets holistically, we, we don't do justice to to both your banks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to reiterate also what Mr. Westcott said uh, about where the natural hedge exists through ordinary customer business net that off as before using derivatives for all kinds of cost and collateral management reasons. And that's worth highlighting as well. Now, this next question is so close to my heart. I'm actually going to name the correspondent. Mr. Abhishek Das asks, this is so close. I love this. Which yield curve is better, 
for the IRRBB calculation. A market realized zero coupon bond yield curve or a stochastically modeled yield curve? Who wants to take that one? Now, see, I know why I love that question, right? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I want all of you to have an opinion on that, actually. I want every one of you to have an opinion on that, starting with Mr. Carter. Uh, all of them and none of them. <laughs> so you're not too fussed, are you? Whether there's a zero coupon bond, you, you think they're both, they're both equally wrong. <laughs> you have to use one, though. Okay. You've got to pick one. No, but the thing is, it, they are. I don't. I, I like using this term, but maybe lots of people don't. It's a good guess, isn't it? The yield curve is a good guess. But you've got to pick one. Yeah, so pick one and stick with it. Yeah, but which one would you pick? You're the chair of Alco. You're approving the curve. Don't care. No, you've got to pick one, my friend. Otherwise, Zero. you're going home. Zero coupon curve. Thank you. Malgazata. Um, I think I do agree with the. Um theoretical aspect of it i think we touched on it before with my answer that um you should always even when you're communicating uh what, what i think you should do is um it's always assumption based what what we're doing um we're doing our best efforts to predict the future to consider all the factors and what's the best assumption to make um and uh, i think this is around proving that you did your homework right but you cannot be correct all the time. Oh, well, no one ever is. Thank you, Magazata. Michael? I, I think I would actually take both curves and then and try to to explain the difference. <laughs> That's not very German, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think for me, with a lot of these assumptions, it's about understanding the difference, understanding the model risk. And then for, we discussed about the two banks that Claire used uh, for non-maturing uh, deposits. There's one paper I've seen where what they did, and I, I thought it was quite powerful, they, similar to what Claire did earlier, they just showed this is your EVE profile without behavioral assumptions, and this is your EVE profile with behavioral assumptions, and it was a tenfold difference. I think it was 2.7% with behavioral assumptions and around 27% of CET1 impact without. And then I, I think that's for me, rather than trying to chase one specific curve, it's about understanding why are they different and, and, and therefore I would look at both. Thank you. Claire? Um, I would agree with that about looking at both, but I would also add in that with your interest rate risk, you're mainly looking at the deltas when you're calculating your EVE. Um, so that's why I personally would say it wouldn't have a massive impact either way. <laughs> I, I'm agreeing with you, but you still had to pick one, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because, he, because he didn't say he didn't care. He said he was having both. I don't mind that. Right, Mr. Westcott. I'm not going to pick uh, immediately. Uh, I just make the point that at the executive committee and ALCOs and things like that, you, you have a certain amount of time in the room. And what you don't want to do is blow that time, spending it all of it talking about which curve you use when there may be a big exposure that you need to discuss. So I'm going to sit on the, the fence, Morad, and say, use your time wisely. Uh, and you know, I'd much rather get the key messages over to your finance director um, than miss one of them because I'm talking about the curve, unless the curve is one of the key messages. Nicely summarized. OK, uh, I, have, I must admit, at the ALCO level, possibly you'll get 10 minutes to talk about your interpolation model or whether you use a, a model curve. At the XCO level, they're not going to know what we're talking about. So we might as well just say, here's the curve. And we've used this, no disrespect intended, by the way. You know, I've sat on XCO, so I've noticed, you know, I would be, I would be insulting myself. Um, but um, absolutely right. It's, it's technically interesting. It's intellectually interesting. But at the end of the day, and as Claire said, it's, it's not necessary material, but great, fantastic. Okay, how about this one then? Staying with the technical. What can be said about the core volume, the core for NMDs, when there is partial repricing? Let us say you tend to pass on 50% of the interest rate increase or decrease. Is core 0% or should you look at a synthetic core by assuming some cash flows are 100% repriceable and some are 0% repriceable, the synthetic core. Who wants to take that one about NMDs? Everyone's favorite topic. Michael? Yeah, for, for me, from, from, from my own experience, I would be less worried about that. Uh, what I would be worried about, and I speak from experience, is I had two teams. I had a team of liquidity risk experts, really PhD level experts, 
and another team of IBB experts, highly qualified guys. Both came to me and said, Michael, these are our outflow assumptions under different scenarios. And then I said, it looks very conceptually, it, it, it looks there's some, some uh, commonality. When I then said, can you look at each other, can you speak to each other, almost arranging a forced marriage just to make sure that when we talk about what is core and what is not core, um, that we've got a common understanding between both teams. They didn't get tired to explain to me that these are different, different scenarios, different, different types of core that play out in different scenarios. When you look at the, at the bank failures this year in 2023, the crisis did not make that distinction. When, especially if you move further down the severity of a crisis, you will be hit on, 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 on both sides. You will be hit on, on the liquidity outflows mean that also your, all your IBB hedges, no matter how you qualify the core amount, uh, may, may become meaningless. So I think for me, the, 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 the more important question would be really to make sure have we considered scenarios that's really severe where we see large liquidity outflows that, that in, invalidate the whole um, NRI on an, and uh, the whole hatching of non-maturing deposit. So I think that would be something I would look into more. Thank you. Uh, anyone else on that? Dean? Um, I just slightly differently um, ask my lending teams and my savings teams what they think about the real world and what could happen rather than just ask the boffins because they can dial in some real world experience. The boffins. What are you saying? If you've got a PhD or an ivory tire, what are you well, saying? <laughs> <time's>... <laughs> okay. no, no, that wasn't me. I didn't turn you off, Dean. Right. Okay. Did you want to respond to that? Oh, Chris, you. I'm not sure. Sure, this works. It does. Um, so my approach to start with, not necessarily the end solution, was to look at all of the different market rates and look at the pricing on the product and see which of the market rates my product pricing most closely correlated with. Um, and assuming that my core balance is my core balance, so taking Michael's uh, thoughts into consideration, so I've got something I'm happy as core, then I would have thought I'm minis minimizing my interest rate sensitivity if I can place my core balance in accordance with its uh, repricing behavior, uh, so where it correlates best, uh, which in the example probably won't be like very short term, would probably be six to 12 months, I would have thought. In, in the one, yes, the agreed. Yeah, in the example, yes. Michael, you want to say another word? Yeah, what, what I would, um, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think for me, what is important when, when we discuss this question is, uh, is what I call a severity continuum. And I, the way I think about it is, at the one end of the uh, severity continuum, you've got a severe stress, but it's more, let's say, a market-wide stress. At the other extreme end, it's an, it's a combined stress with a huge idiosyncratic element. And I think depending on where your scenario sits on, on this uh, continuum, there may be different, different answers may be appropriate. Thank you, yes. Okay, very quick one. Um, does the new, e or the later, the last uh, EBA guidance emphasize NII more than EVE? Who wants to take that one? Do, did, do we get an impression that uh, the late EBA was now focusing more on NII than EVE or not? I don't personally get the impression that they're focusing on more on NII. I think they've still got more of a focus on EVE um, because it's EVE that can collapse a bank overnight and that's what the regulator is bothered about at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think what what's in my head is from, from looking at maybe over, over the last 20 years, my impression has always been when I went to the US, it seems that a lot of banks were more focused on NRI and then less on EVE. And when I came back to Europe, I had the impression here the at least regulators are tended to be more focused on EVE, slightly less on NRI. And then maybe this 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 gap is or this this imbalance is now readjusting. Okay. Before we move on to there's another question um that is really worth it's just it's great. But I'll, before I come I'm just gonna chuck a a googly in. Uh, 
a googly cricket eater R right <laughs> i'm going to chuck in something from left field that's what an american would say right um what happens to a list and you know a bank that's listed on a stock exchange and has its share price you know explicitly valued the share price is there what happens generally nine times out of ten over many years what happens to a bank's share price oh by the way quick just make sure we're all on the same page the valuation of a listed entity is its share price multiplied by the number of shares just make sure we're all on the same page right what happens to a bank's share price 99 times out of 100 when interest rates go up the share price goes up right so the valuation of the entity has increased while the rates have gone up yes we're agreed what happens to the eve of the bank when the interest rate goes up <laughs> it got the eve the actual present value the present the net present value goes down so i just chucked that in because the panelists were saying it was clear there was michael saying eve can sink a bank you know you get a shock scenario the bank goes under but that would seem to be countered by the fact that if there's a rise in rates the share price goes up does anyone want to just hit that ball right back past me over my head I think it just explains that everything's important. Eve, NII, share price, rating, products, fixed, variable, current accounts, capital, liquidity, type of liquidity, everything is important. And you can't isolate one and go, this is the big risk, or, oh, we're fine on that. You can't really mitigate risk. You could just maneuver it into something that's more manageable. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that one? No? Hit, ball's been hit back over my head before, Dean. Uh, eventually, you're going to have credit risk as an issue in your situation. Because the rise in rates it has may, increased defaults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh, all right, okay. We're going to argue over dinner later. Right, okay. Here's one for uh, all of you. Does, oh, I love this one. Cat Leho. I love this one. Does IFRS 9 have any impact on CSRBB? Who's going to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Carter, you can come last on that one. Does IFRS 9 have any impact on CSRBB? Um, so I'm not sure if I'm heard. Um, Can we hear her? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Speak up. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so obviously... Um, this is a this is a, a topic where you know it's not so linear. What I can say is definitely um, you know just the fact that credit spread risk in the banking book, if I can reiterate, is not actually a credit credit risk as such. Um, so that's the coming back to the definition of the um, um, of, of 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 the risk within that framework. Um, but touching on the credit risk in potentially isolation, I think more just started that he's going to argue about this later on. Um, but this is one of the factors that I think is, is definitely emerging. Um, so when we think about the IRBB or Treasury, uh, we do think uh, about this, let's say, those key risk types in every bank. You have multiple frameworks under your wider framework, and this is how you report, how you look at risk, how you structure your teams. But at the same time, uh, you know, you, you might have, um, you know, beneficial impacts on your balance sheet uh, from the interest rate risk side of things. But at the same time, you might see higher level of defaults um, amongst your clients. And this is also the environment that we're currently entering in a sense that people um, and businesses uh, were, well, I wouldn't, for the lack of better word, I'm going to use spoiled, have been spoiled by that um, cheap uh, um, cost to, to, to fund their businesses and activities. And whatever assumptions or whatever outflows or whatever defaults you've seen over the past 10 years, this is not, uh, not something you should base your future view of the world on. Because the 
world, the, the look of the world over the past 10, 15 years is not something that you have seen over the past two years. Two years is not long enough for you to make significant statistical assumptions going forward, but it is just um, to reflect that it is all link interlinked and whatever um, models you're using, uh, those models might not be sensitive enough, and talking here about also credit risk uh, element of it, sensitive enough to, to um, risk factor changes because they are based on the assumptions that were um, less volatile than we're seeing right now. You, Michael, I can see you. Thank you, Magazata. Michael? Yeah, just building on that. Allow me to invite you to a thought experiment. Let's say, and then, and going even further than the question, let's say I would split you up in groups. I would ask you to look after IFRS for one is, let's assume we are talking about one and the same balance sheet. I would ask you to look at CSRBB. I would ask you to look at liquidity, would ask you to look at capital, would ask you to look at, at other types of risk. And in the first experiment, I let you all do it in in, in isolation. And then I just aggregate it and present it to, to a governance committee and say, that's, that's the impact of whatever scenario. Yes, that works if uh, they're going to pick one, right? Yeah. I think the questioner is trying to say, am I double counting? Is if I'm yeah. provisioning on a forward looking basis, yeah, which I, the life is not all I about. Ah, oh, okay, right. So that's the first round of the experiment. Okay. I, I think there is a risk of double counting. It's, it's, it's stupid aggregation. And now comes the second round, this time, I leave you in your roles, but I say you should speak to each other. You should look at, at, at the cross impacts between you. And I can guarantee you, you come to better results. And I've seen it, I've seen it firsthand because I've, I've fought for this, this cross fertilization. You need, and, and that I think reduces the, the risk of double counting. And, and I think that helps to present the real risk to the committee. But you get to dramatically different results because for a start, you may have and in the first sort of experiments, you may have different projections of, of how the balance sheet will evolve. It's as simple as that. But maybe check for your own bank. I would bet that more banks follow what we did in the first iterations than banks that follow what we did in second iterations. But in my, from what I've seen, it was a eureka moment. In the second iteration, you get way more meaningful results. I think that's also the reason why we should not think especially if it's a very severe scenario, we should not think uh, about IBB in an isolation. Thank you very much, Michael. We're happy on that one. There was actually a related comment, but I think it's the same one from B. Ferreira. Would there, is there some crossover between CSRBB in a bank and existing uh, fair market value frameworks for credit risk, IFRS 9? You've just answered that, absolutely. I by definition, there's some double counting because I'm provisioning the capital or I'm making an adjustment based on an EV impact of CSRBB. So there's got to be some, not crossover, I'd say, One's one. It's either one or t'other. I'm not going to aggregate them because I'm double counting a capital impact. I'm wasting capital. Yeah, and if we should not become slaves of these frameworks, we should aim to to present the the, the joint risk and. Good man. Thank you. Right. Okay. I think um, while I look through, sees any more? Do we, oh gosh, yes. Question in the room. Uh, you need to run rapido. No, I don't speak Italian, um, or is that Spanish? I don't speak any European language. Bangla, I can do. <laughs> Is that European? Gosh. <laughs> okay, go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Sonny. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I find your panel extremely interesting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for feedback. So my, my question is not technical because you are all technical people. So I don't know if it will make sense, but uh, uh, we know that the global financial system, the way it's currently run, is still built around uh, Bretton Woods institutions. So um, I'm trying to find out how do you adjust your assumptions and all the complex decisions that you have to take on a daily basis in your job to perform your duty in uh, amid an increasing uh, global political issues, the geopolitical issues in a globalized world that is uh, increasingly becoming fragmented. Uh, for example, Global South, Briggs, and Global versus Global West. What's your take on that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I th <laughs> thank you. For, thank you, sir. It's, uh, it's a macro. It's a sort of... A, a, all right. The question was, what's the take of the panel on addressing wider views, geopolitical issues, the north-south uh, 
econ economic divergence, the fact that Bretton Woods institutions are possibly the, 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 the cornerstone of the, the global economy still today, uh, possibly I think less so today. Um, how do we manage through that? That was your question, was it, sir? In a globalized financial world, uh, slightly beyond interest rate risk in the banking book. But uh, Michael, I can see you're itching to answer that one. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it goes beyond interest rate risk in the banking book, but rightly so. Um, and and I, I think it is right to ask this question. I, I think what it leads to is um, also considering tools like reverse stress testing, not only reverse stress testing for IABB as, as EBA paper suggests, so not only for this risk drive, but really looking at what type of of, of scenarios that have multiple multiple aspects where interest rate risk is just one of the parameters can can bring your business model down. That I think would be one answer. The other answer I think would be if you talk about assumptions um, to make them transparent in governance. And I liked also that would be my second point and my, my final point is I liked what Claire said in, in her speech when she said they are not hatched by derivatives. They are not actually hatched. They were hatched by assumptions. <laughs> and then Love. to bring that nuance out, I think, is in a governance meeting, is is really helpful. Yes, that's worth. I I, I just remembered it now. It's a fantastic description. They were hedged by assumptions. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. You want to add to that? Just uh, so I think I'm still thinking of an answer because it was a, a deep question. Um, there's a few developments in the last 10 years where we're encouraged to uh, look at our overall balance sheet in segments. So, for instance, by currency, uh, by legal entity. Um, and uh, I see, for example, in the last four or five years, there's become much more emphasis on group risk. Um, so the risks that lie between the entities that operate within a group. So I think where you're coming from is is perhaps just more of that. It's the way that we uh, segregate and analyze our activities may throw up risks that we didn't even know existed. I mean, I think about uh, intraday liquidity risk, slightly different topic, but the whole point is in 2000 and seven we just said oh it's fine you you use the liquidity twice you know it's fine don't worry about it and then we discovered when lehman brothers went bust that actually that doesn't work uh and i think where you're coming from is a little bit of the same uh there are certain of our analytical techniques that basically don't work but we've got to find out where and then segregate accordingly Thank you very much. Okay, uh, there's uh, one or two left on the screen. Before I uh, move it to them, just for those in the room, uh, if you want to help yourself to a final drink, please, uh, please, <laughs> I know the panel are interested, please do help yourself or, or request at the bar at the back. Those of you on screen, um, you know, well, hopefully you can, you can get a drink from somewhere, right? Okay, so for now, that's, that, was, that was facetious, forgive me. Right, okay, so, um, <laughs> you know I'm joking, right? Okay, I got a I got a, a question here on the on the uh, on the screen uh, from Katya. Given the rates levels now, many banks are seeing the migration of uh, current accounts and call accounts, instant access savings accounts to term deposits. Uh, you know, a, a shift in and a new pattern in client uh, deposit customers, you know, preferences. How do we reconcile the regulatory requirement for a constant balance sheet assumption when, in reality, that's not being reflected at all. I think I can guess what I'm really going to say on that reality and assumptions, especially if we consider the changes in the regulations are very recent, uh, done during a uh, during a period of sharp rises in rates. Um, anyone want to take that? We've seen changes in customer behavior because the rates environment has changed, yet the rec regulation requires us to assume, a, in certain cases, a constant balance sheet. Um, what, what do we think of that? How do we reconcile that? Mm. I, I, I challenge pretty much the same question with the major regulator and the answer I got was that they have used this assumption because it allows them to compare banks. 100 percent. That's, that's, that's what I thought it was. The, so that, I thought the EBA did that so they could just compare the results across banks, whereas if they allowed a, a dynamic one, uh, uh, an actual forecast one, they wouldn't be able to compare. Personally, I think the value to an individual bank as an internal metric is in using your BAU forecast balance sheet. But from a regulator, they want to do the constant. Thank you very much. Yes. Dean, you want to say something about that? 
uh, same stuck record. Um, do what you think you should be doing, not what you think the regulator wants you to do, and stress test everything. So look at what your expected outcome is, your expected behavioural outcome, and then look at what how that might change. So how how it could how you might end up with your current accounts having to pay interest or hitting floors or whatever. So don't do what the regulator says. D sorry, don't aim at doing re what the regulator says. Do what you think is right for your balance sheet and do some scenarios. Thank you. OK, I think um, I think we can knock this on the head. I don't see any more questions on the screen. Does any more anyone have any questions in the room? No. OK. In which case, thank you very much for your attention in the room. Thank you very much for your attention and joining online. I would like to thank our esteemed panel. I was loving hearing them give their views and opinions. So uh, please, can we give a round of applause for Mr. Dean Carter, Ms. Malgazata Taneka, Mr. Michael Eichhorn, Ms. Claire Trifle, and Mr. Chris Westcott, my main, main, main man. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I do. <laughs> Thank you.